hopefully that energy boost will carry you through the rest of the week that in the midst of your week when things are a little drizzly outside, you'll be able to jump, jump somewhere and inspire everybody. Don't, don't do it in the line at Walmart. People might, <laughs> might es escort you out. Um, you just never know. Have you ever had somebody like just to ask you, do you have faith? Do you have faith in Jesus? What do you think? What, what do you think about that? How would you respond to that? What my challenge is for the next couple of weeks is we're going to take a look at faith, deep faith, faith that goes beyond superficial. And, and my goal here is to make some of us uncomfortable. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the role of Scripture, is to change your perspective, because oftentimes our perspective is skewed. And I feel that right now we are in a difficult time. We're in a time of what I call the great spiritual drift. Right? People that have been a part of church for decades are just kind of like, what's the point? And I think we need to kind of come back to some beginnings, to some core values, to understand deeply. And so my challenge for you this morning is if you're in one of those situations where you say, well, of course I have faith, be careful. It may not be what you think it is. And I'm hoping to do that in order to draw you in and say, I don't know. Maybe I don't have it after all. Because what you find is when Jesus comes on the scene, you find that people were confused. Jesus said, this is what I'm looking for. This is what God is looking for. And they say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't get that. And of course, the challenge for all of us is, are we in that boat too? And we just don't know it. And so in this time of great spiritual drift, I want us to think about how we can come back to the core values of who we are and allow it to transform us from pew sitters to activists and advocates to be a living army of spiritual warriors that are prayerful, that are dedicated, and that are committed. I love this quote by uh, Alistair McIntyre. He said, I cannot answer the question what I ought to do, or if you will, what I ought to be or what I should become, unless I can first answer the question of which story am I a part? What is your story? What, what part are we talking about? That's why I said at the beginning that I want us to go through this Apostles' Creed. This is our story. We need to be reminded, what is your story from beginning of the first time you, you cried in the doctor's hands to the time that they say goodbye. What is your story? My story is simple. I believe in God the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. These are the things that define who I am. But the challenge for all of us is that, is that truly what defines your life, what defines who you are? Because oftentimes you will find that your story or your identity is shaped by your frame of reference, the lens that you look through, the story that other people have given to you. And I want to share some of the things that may get us off skew from time to time. And I think we are in the midst of a great upheaval, a great reformation as powerful as the one that Luther went through. The first one is perhaps no great surprise. It is the filter of technology. Technology has had a huge impact on you. What, something better will always come along. Right? The, the, what it's about to unfold is always better and brighter and more wise than what was in the past. Right? We're always on a, lot, on a line of improvement and technology. We look to technology as this mysterious force that will always make our lives better. And so it has an impact on you. You look for technology to communicate with people, and yet we find that technology is only as good as the information that is put into it. 
Do you find that your life is driven more by technology, by your cell phone or your, your Facebook page or your Twitter account? Technology is having a huge impact on the people that you live around. They look at technology as that mysterious force that is out there that is going to make your life better. That's a frame of reference that people go through. Maybe you're having struggles because you have a childhood filter. That's what your family did. They, they took you to church. They dragged you to church. They may not have liked it. You may not have liked it. You didn't like the people that were there, and they didn't like you, but you just went through the motions. And maybe that's your filter. Maybe that's how you see life. You see life as good and bad, as there's no gray areas. That church and spirituality is for another generation, it's for another time, and that time has passed. It's for those people that are superstitious about spirituality, not for us that are modern people that have such information as Google. For us, we see life differently. And of course, all of us, I think, are driven to some extent by what is called the urgency filter, right? You, you, do you ever seem like you have less time now than you did before? Your calendar is always full. Maybe you're even sitting there now saying, boy, I hope he gets done on time because I have places to go and people to see. Do you realize that when John Wesley, who was preaching in the 18th century, when he would preach, he would give 39-point sermons that would last three and four hours. And thousands came, right? You're going, if you last more than 20 minutes, you've lost me. And the reason was, is they were eating, they were hungry for it, right? They didn't have television, they didn't have radio, they didn't have cell phones. This was their multimedia. And he came and people were stunned by the amount of good news that they heard. Uh, we, on the other hand, are saying, can you put it in a sound bite? Right? I, I hate to say it, uh, but one of the things that we've been talking about when we talk about discipleship and we're talking about the church, right? We were made for more. Three little words trying to summarize the whole purpose of the church so that you can remember it. And even that is too hard. We are urgent and Somebody once wrote a small book called The Tyranny of the Urgent. Do you ever feel like you're terrorized by your watch or your calendar or your clock? The things that you have to do, I'm not going to get it all done. I've got too much on my plate. And I hope that you're nodding yes, because I don't want to be the only one in that category. And so this is, this is in the backdrop, and I thought, what we need to do is I think we need to get back to some basics. I want to get back to what we're really about. Why are you here this morning? Are you here to put in your time? Are, are you here that you might hear something positive? Are you here to be challenged? Are you here to be invited into something bigger? Are you here to see the door open and God inviting you in? Or are you just kind of saying, I just want to stay in a nice quiet room for an hour and then I can go home? to the buzz of chaos that I call my life. I wanted to spend some time, and we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about following Jesus as Jesus described it. And you may find that it's a, a little bit different than perhaps what you're used to. It's the essentials of Christian belief. What does it mean to be a part of this thing that we call Christianity? Now, last week I wanted to highlight, or not last week, two weeks ago, I want to highlight some of the things that we've talked about, and you'll find these in your sermon notes. First of all, it's the basic of Christian life. What is the basis of Christian existence, the, the thing that we all hold in common, that we are committed to Christ? Are you committed to Christ or to something else? What holds sway in your life? What has ultimate authority in your life? The second thing is, is, are you hungry for more? Are, are you so enamored with what Jesus is offering, a new life that Jesus is offering to you that you're willing to give everything, your time, your talent, you're willing to open up a book, you're willing to 
listen to other people and share their stories? Are you willing to take that extra step because you want to know more? You want to experience more? You know that there's more out there. It's, it's like Christmas Eve. You know Christmas is coming and you can hardly, as a child, you can hardly wait for that day. You know that there is more and you're longing to find it. Are you hungry for more or are you satisfied with superficial? Are you willing to lead? Now, I struggled with this for a while because normally what we would say, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to give? And a lot of people would say, yeah, I'm willing to, I'm willing to serve. When you ask me, I might consider it. I'd be willing to serve. But Jesus doesn't ask you to serve. He asks you to lead. Think about this. At the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus makes this ultimate statement, which we're going to be coming back to in the coming weeks because it is a powerful statement. He looks at all of you disciples and said, now, here's the thing. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. That's your commission. That's your commanding officer giving you orders. Therefore, go. Are you willing to step up instead of waiting in the background. That's the challenge. These are the assumptions of a basic Christian life. And so I wanted to start at the very beginning, this commitment to Christ. But this commitment to Christ is a, is a funny word. We call it faith. And yet faith for us means multiple different things. People give it different interpretations, different definitions. Maybe you have your own that you are that you've depended upon, but I wanted to share with you a couple of things about faith that will help guide us into a whole different realm of seeing what God is doing and why it is that the churches are so often struggling. Now, last time we got together, I said there's a couple of misconceptions about this funny word. The first one is, is that faith is not magic, right? It's not magic. If you have it, that new things begin to happen for you. If you have it, it allows new opportunities to open up. New doors will open up if you have it. It isn't like Star Wars where it's the force. If you have this thing, this thing called force, it will make other things happen for you. It is not a force that you can wield or you can shape. Okay? Faith is not manipulative. If you have faith, if you get a whole bunch of people together and you pray really, 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 really hard and you have really, really, really good faith that God is forced to do things that God would not normally want to do. We do this. We, we agree that sometimes if we can come together and we are really powerful in our faith, well, then God has to give us the things that we've asked for. And so the problem is, is when life doesn't turn out the way you expect, when hardships truly come, we're kind of thrown aside and said, well, it must not be true. The problem is, is we're signing God's names to checks that he didn't write. We're saying, God will do this for you. If you become a Christian, life will be good. And yet deep inside, we know that there are hardships. It, they're refining us. They're shaping us. And finally, faith is not a method. If you jump through a number of hoops, if you attend here, if you give so much, if you go through these steps, if you achieve a certain amount of biblical knowledge, then you have great faith, and there you go. It is not a process that you go through. Charles Hodges once said that faith is not a blind, irrational conviction in order to believe, we must know the, on what we believe and the grounds on which our faith rests. Faith is not a blind ascension to a statement. Do you believe in Jesus? That is not faith. That is just an acknowledgement of something that is a fact. That is without doubt a reality that Jesus did live that he died and he rose. We have talked about this over and over again. The, the evidence for this is overwhelming. So what should we do when we're, we're struggling with our faith, what that essence of our faith is, that core value of what it is? 
Now, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews was written as a sermon to Jews to help them understand. The Jews were sort of locked into to a very process. You, you have all of these regulations, all of these cleanliness laws that you have to abide by. And they said, that's what it's all about. It's about going through the motions. And Jesus said, no, you, you've missed the point. Your, your lens, your paradigm that you're looking through is wrong. So God sent Jesus into the world to say, this is what it really looks like. This is what faith is really all about. Now, in Hebrews, they're writing a sermon that was written to Jews to help explain this new life that is coming on board. On chapter 12 of Hebrews, when we're not sure of the path forward, when we're confused by this spiritual drift, the writers of Hebrews said, let us keep looking to Jesus, not the church, not the multimedia, not the theological, legal, or political culture that is surrounding us. Look to Jesus. For our faith comes from Him. Our faith is not in Him. Our faith comes from Him, and He is the one who makes it perfect. So this thing that we call faith is made perfect in the example of Jesus. He did not give up when he had to suffer shame and die on on a cross. He knew of the joy that would be his later, now sitting at the right side of God. Jesus understood this thing called faith, and he made it perfect, even though he had to go through hardship. So let's talk a little bit about what is this thing that we call faith? In Hebrews chapter 11, the writer describes what faith is. He says, first of all, this is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He said, now a person cannot please God unless he or she has faith. Do you agree with that? Is that a statement? Is that something that you want? Is that something that you long for, to have that depth of faith that is transformational? You cannot come to God without faith. So maybe we ought to know what this is all about. He said, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists. Okay, so that's not faith, right? To just say, I believe God's out there. My faith is that God exists somewhere, somehow. I don't know how, but he's out there somewhere. That's not faith. That's wishful thinking. That's dreaming. That's hopefulness. I hope that he's out there. Have you ever seen people that whenever they're saying something, they're making a promise, have they ever cross their fingers, like, you know, put that behind? Because it means, it's all, I don't know what that means. It's almost like it's just check out. I don't really have to abide by this, right? My fingers are crossed. I hope that this is true, but I'm not really believing it. How many Christians do you know are not really sure that he's out there? If God is not really out there, if you cannot present me evidence that God exists for you, your faith is on very shaky ground, especially when it becomes tested. For anyone who comes to God must believe that He exists and that one must know that God will give what is promised to the one who keeps on looking for Him. Okay, so we have these two elements. One, God exists and that He keeps His promises. God exists, and He keeps His promises. Those two tied together give rise to faith. All right? So faith, faith is beyond believing. We tie them up together and we confuse them together and say, I believe, yeah, I get that, but that's not faith. Right? For example, I believe this church exists, though I may never set foot in it, right? I may believe that an airplane can take off those huge jumbo jets. I I believe it, I see it, but I never participate in it. You can believe that Jesus is real, that Jesus died and he was resurrected and that he lives and the Spirit of God exists in this place and at this time, but you never really participate in it. 
Faith is not believing. Now, I hope that that shakes you for a little while and say it's more about a mental assent, agreement of just saying, oh yes, I see that this is happening. Realize also that faith is beyond the church. It's not just attending here. It's not just showing up. It's not just going through the motions. What the church is, is it gathers people that are on the same spiritual journey in one place so that you can feed and nurture one another. You can strengthen those that are weak and that you can inspire those that are languishing. That you can hunger and thirst for more and that for those of you that are older, you can point the way for those that are younger. And you can mentor one another and that together we as a body can rise up to become more than we ever imagined possible. But that is not faith in itself. It allows the expression of your faith. It allows the expression of your faith. But I come back to the same question. Do you have faith? And of course, lastly, because everything goes in threes, faith is beyond culture. It doesn't depend on the fact of what generation we are. It doesn't depend on um, what technology you have. It transcends all of that. This is the story that you belong to. Whether you agree with it or not, this story is playing out in your life. That's why Jesus so often said to those around, he said, these people's hearts are so hard, they can't see and they cannot hear the story that is playing on around them. They've become so conditioned to just go through the motions. It is beyond your culture. It transcends culture. That's why we love, I love to share the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. It connects us through the generations. So what is it? right? Maybe I've spent too much time telling you what it's not. Maybe we ought to spend a little bit of time talking about what it is and whether you're willing to go that far. The Christian life is not just to believe in Jesus. Did Jesus exist? I don't know. Yes or no. But to believe like Jesus. Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus was committed, Jesus spoke the truth, regardless of the hardship. He knew that all that he did and all that he said was under the authority of the Father. Jesus did that. We want to have faith like Jesus so that we will do what Jesus did for the reasons that Jesus did them. So let me ask you, are you doing what Jesus did? Are you striving to know what Jesus knew? Are you willing to give up your schedule to follow where Jesus leads? See, our goal is not to believe in Jesus, hopefulness, wishful thinking, dreamers. Our goal is to believe like Jesus, do what he did, so that we would go out and minister to the people that Jesus ministered to for the reasons that he did them. In Hebrews chapter 11, and this is the one that we're going to be tearing apart for the next couple of weeks, and we're going to be looking at all of these stories that Jesus told about the centurion, about the leper that came to him, and about his final commandment to all of us. What is faith that Jesus is awakening within all of us? In Hebrews chapter 11, they write, now faith is being sure we will get what we hope for. It is being sure of what we cannot see. And we're going to be tearing that apart. And some of the things that I want you to know about your own life, let's boil this down so that we can take a look at this in the coming weeks. When you take God's authority, have you ever noticed that when Jesus came and he was preaching to the people in Capernaum and Galilee region, people didn't ever go to this rabbi, this traveling rabbi, and say, wow, this is a pretty smart guy. He's pretty smart. Look at, look at how he's looking at this. He knows this stuff. He's a, he's a rabbi. He's supposed to do that. They didn't say that. This guy preaches with authority. 
He's not really smart. He's not wise. He's not powerful. He's not clever. He's a good storyteller. He has authority. Who has authority in your life? What has authority in your life? What dictates to you what you do in your spiritual life? But it isn't just knowing the authority, the the existence of God. It's that you will get what He promised, the death and resurrection sealed that God will deliver on His promises. So that whenever you can say, He is the authority, and I trust that He will do what He said He will do, when those two things come together, you have a natural response. You will do what He asked you to do. When He commanded you to serve and to give and to share, you will do it because He has the authority in your life and you trust that He will do what He's going to say. So what does that mean for us? Faith is a response. Faith is not a thing you possess. I have faith. I don't do anything with it, but I have... No, it's a response. It's an action. When you have faith, you are actually doing something. So for all of you that said, yes, I have faith, great, tell me what you're doing for the kingdom. Boy, I don't know. I'm not doing a lot. That's because you have no faith. So our final clue here, and this is not... This is not meant to be bad news because this is an awakening that we can all go through and say, ah, now I see what he's talking about, and I want to be a part of that. The question that I have for all of us is, do you have faith? I pray that the Spirit of God will rest upon you, will stir within you. For in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live because they have, they have accepted his authority and they have trusted his word and they have responded in kind. Do you have faith? For the next couple of weeks, I want to tear apart some of those critical stories, those encounters that Jesus had where he looked at people and he said, how can you have such little faith? Why did he say that? That's kind of an odd thing to say. Or why did he go to the centurion and go to the centurion and said, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. This Roman Gentile pagan, I haven't seen this kind of faith in anybody in the religious elite. Or what about the leper that comes and says, God, Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. We will find that faith is woven through it, through the authority and through our ability to trust that he will do what he says he'll do. And for all of us, we have to wrestle with which of those two things do you struggle with the most? This morning, you have an opportunity for us to come and share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Holy Communion is an opportunity to say, we're not all where we want to be. We're on a journey of faith. We're growing, we're learning, and this is another step along that foothold. Maybe you're not where you want to be, but here's the good news. Jesus isn't done with you yet. And if you're willing to take just one more step, just follow when he calls. Allow your faith to take root. Your whole life will unfold in ways that you cannot yet imagine. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to share in this sacrament. We pray, O God, that you will continue to work within us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that our faith will rest in you and our faith will carry us into a bright new future. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for Holy Communion, I want you to just take a moment to let your heart settle. Watch this short video as we prepare for the sacrament.